the model tells you, um, if I take this action, I could get blown here, or I could get blown here. We have the model. Um, and that lets us look ahead. It lets us look at this whole tree of contingencies of what might happen in the short-term future. And the main point of this slide is to say that we don't need to solve the whole MDP. Solving the whole MDP is a big waste of resource. We just need to focus on the sub-MDP that starts from now. And, you know, what happens in some unreachable part of the state space or something we're not going to reach for another year from now uh, doesn't really matter to us. It just matters the sub-MDP that we're in right now. Let's do well for that. <coughs> And sometimes that can be dramatically easier than solving for the whole MDP. So that's forward search. We solve for the sub-MDP starting from now using look ahead. Um, so simulation-based search is a forward search paradigm that uses sample-based planning. In other words, what we do is we start from now and we imagine what might happen next. We imagine a trajectory of experience by sampling it from our model. So we literally say, you know, right now, I am in this situation. I'm in this position in my game of chess, and I'm going to imagine what my opponent might do and what I would do after that, and then what um, my opponent might do after that. I imagine the whole sequence, or I'm climbing up the, the mountain, and I imagine if I was to put my hand to here, I'd be in that state, and then I'd have to move my hand to here, and then my foot to here. I imagine the whole trajectory out, and then I learn from that imagined experience. But it's forward search because we're always starting from now. We're not starting from some arbitrary part of the state space. We always root it from the current moment and imagine forwards by rolling into the future. And that gives us a real focus on what will happen next rather than distributing our efforts over irrelevant things. And the sampling helps to focus us on what really matters because we sample actions that we choose and we sample things which are actually um, have high probability from the environment because that's what sampling does. So we end up seeing the situations that really matter. We focus in on the important parts of the space very quickly. And then what we do is once we've got these trajectories of experience, we apply model-free reinforcement learning. We treat this just like usual. We say, OK, I'm starting here. I'm running some trajectory. I start from here again. I run some other trajectory. Start again, run some other trajectory. That becomes the source of experience. And we apply our familiar model-free reinforcement learning algorithms to those trajectories. And that is simulation-based search. So what does it look like? So we start from now. We start from this ST. This superscript just means you know which simulation we're in. And we run from one to big K of those simulations. And we generate multiple episodes of experience. Start from our root state, action reward, state action reward, all the way to the end. Um, we do that big K times. And we sample these things from our model, or from the real world, if someone gives us the real MDP. If someone tells us the rule of, rules of chess, we don't need to learn it. <clears throat> and now, we apply model-free reinforcement learning to this data, to our simulated experience. And we use our favorite method. So we could use um, Monte Carlo. If we use Monte Carlo control, um, then that gives us a method called Monte Carlo search. If we apply SASA, that gives us a method called TD search. I'll talk about both of those. This one's particularly well known. So we pick our favorite model free RL algorithm. It's not meant to be exhaustive. You could pick anything. You could use um, least squares policy iteration. You could use, you know, pick your favorite method, apply it to your simulated experience, and you have a search algorithm. <clears throat> so what does this look like? So let's start with the simplest possible version. Um, this is what I call simple Monte Carlo search. Um, so let's just assume that we've got some model, or someone tells us the rules of the game, or we've learned our model of the, how the rocks are working, or how the robot's walking, how the helicopter's flying, and we have some simulation policy pi. So a simulation policy is just some way that we are going to pick actions in our imagination. And now what we're going to do is we're going to consider, from our root state, we're going to consider all the actions we could take from that root state. So we just consider the, the root of this tree. So I could take action, I could go left or I could go right. I could move my hand here or I could move my hand here. Um, and for each one, I'm going to generate big K episodes by sampling from our model and from the simulation policy. So we're going to pick actions according to our own simulation policy. And we're going to see how the world transitions by using our model. Um, 
And then we're just going to evaluate each of these actions in the simplest possible way by Monte Carlo evaluation, which just means we take the mean of the returns. In other words, you know, if I'm saying I could go left, and if I go left, I'm going to run 100 different simulations where I go left, and I'm going to see how well I did on those 100 simulations and take the mean of all the returns, and that's going to be my evaluation of how good it is to go left. Then I'm going to do the same thing for going right, run another 100 simulations, um, take the mean of all the returns for going right, that's going to be my evaluation of how good it is to go right. We evaluate each of those in turn, um, and what we see is that if we just evaluate our actions, that gives us an action value function for the root of this search tree, starting from my root, considering all of the actions I could take, um, and just taking the mean of these returns, that's all we're saying. And all this is saying is that this thing, by the law of large numbers, really does give us the true value function for our simulation policy. If we take, run enough simulations, we really will converge on the, the expected value of those returns, which is the definition of a value function. And then all we do is we pick actions. We pick the real action to take. Now, do I go left or do I go right in the real world? Well, I just pick the one which had the higher mean, the one which did better in my simulations. That's the idea of simple Monte Carlo search. Is that clear as a method? So yeah, question. the simulation policy related? So like if your simulation policy is pretty poor, that wouldn't, wouldn't really work, right? Yeah. Do you, do you update it as you go? Or? Um, that would be the next slide. So oh, we're, okay. here, here we're talking about simple Monte Carlo search, which basically is the simulation policy is fixed. More sophisticated methods are going to improve the policy as we go. So yeah, great question. OK, so now I'm going to tell you about something which is actually a state-of-the-art search method. This solves really challenging problems. It's a very effective planning method. Um, and I'll give a, one brief case study from the game of Go, where this is the only method which has been able to achieve um, strong human-level performance. Um, so let's assume we have some model. And now, again, what we're going to do is we're going to start from the root state we would generate trajectories of experience starting from that route um, using a current simulation policy. And the difference is that now we're actually going to view this thing as something which is like living. This policy is going to start to improve over as we start to do this. And what we're going to do is instead of just evaluating you know, the route actions of going left and going right, we're going to evaluate every state action pair that we visit. So we're going to start to build a search tree that contains all of the states that we visited so far and all of the actions that we've tried from those states so far. We're going to build a search tree up. Um, so we're going to basically have something where we're going to have something, you know, like one of these pictures where um, every step we're going to run some simulation out. And at the end of that simulation, what we're going to do is we're going to store up an action value basically for all of the actions that we can take from all of the states. We're going to store a Q value here, a Q value here, Q value here, a Q value here. For everything that you revisit, we're going to start to estimate how good is it to be in that state and to take that action. We're going to start to estimate all of those Q values. Whereas in simple Monte Carlo search, we were just doing it at the root. And the way we're going to estimate those things is in the obvious way. We're going to do it again just by taking the mean of everything we've seen from that point onwards. So if we want to know, if we're in this state and we take this action, how good is it? What we're going to do is we can consider all of the simulations that have passed through this action and we're going to take the mean of those returns. And that's going to be our estimate of how good it is to be in this state and take this action. So we basically just record in every part of our search tree, um, we record these Q values. And this thing is just, again, it's just counting. This is our fancy notation for saying, let's just take the mean of all these returns and look at all the times we actually pass through that state action pair. Um, and what we do, uh, well, at the end of the search, what we're going to do, again, we're going to pick the action that has the highest Q value at the root. But there's one big difference now, which is we're going to, we've got this rich information in our search tree, and we can use that rich information in the search tree to make our simulation policy better. <clears throat> so the way we do that now is that after every simulation, we're going to make our simulations improve. And we do that in the same way that we do policy improvement in previous classes, where we're going to basically look at the Q values. We're going to maximize over the Q values in the search tree to make them better. Now, the only distinction is that here, we don't have a complete table of Q values everywhere. We've only got them within the search tree. So we break up our simulation into two phases. 
whether we're in the tree or whether we've gone beyond the tree where we just don't have any information. So when we're in our tree, then we improve our policy. We pick actions so as to maximize the Q values that we've got stored in our tree. So every node of our tree, we just look at our children, I look at all the actions I can take, and I just pick the, the action which gives the highest Q value, possibly with some exploration as well. Um, but when I run beyond my tree, and I don't have anything stored, I haven't seen these states before, I just behave according to my some default random simulation policy, which again can be naive. But we're expanding the frontier of what we know about until eventually our simulation policy becomes smart everywhere. <coughs> and so the algorithm is that every simulation, we evaluate our states by Monte Carlo evaluation, but then we improve our policy, our tree policy, by, for example, epsilon greedy, or smarter strategies using bandits. And so this algorithm, it turns out, is, is one we've already seen before. It's basically Monte Carlo control, but applied to simulated episodes of experience that start from the root state. So we're always starting from the state we're in. We're starting from this moment now. We're running our experience from now onwards. We're applying Monte Carlo control to the experience that we encounter from now onwards. So it's our familiar methods from before, but applied to do search, applied to focus on what's going to happen next and understand this rich set of contingencies. And because it's Monte Carlo control, we already know that this thing works. And in fact, what this tells us is that this thing actually has to find the optimal search tree. It has to find the optimal solution, the best possible way to behave from this state and this action onwards. You know, this, this tells us how to find the best action from now onwards if we keep running this forever and continue to explore all state action pairs and do the usual things that we need for convergence. OK, let's make this concrete with an example. Um, so this is the game of Go. Uh, I used to work on this. It's, it's um, fun problem. Uh, it's the oldest game in the world, uh, 2,500 years old, roughly. And what's interesting about it is that it's considered to be like the hardest of the classic board games that, that people play. And it's considered a grand challenge task for AI. And back when chess was solved, you know, everyone shifted over to consider Go instead because it was considered a much more challenging, interesting problem for computers. And um, it was considered a problem where, where you needed these kind of magical human intuitions to do well. Um, because brute force search just didn't get anywhere and go. Um, so the traditional approaches to brute force search, which were so effective in chess, uh, basically didn't work in go. Um, and so let's just very briefly understand the game. How many people here have heard of go or played? How many people know the rules? Okay, about a quarter. So very briefly in one slide, uh, you take a board, uh, which is usually 19 by 19, but can be smaller. I'll illustrate it with some smaller ones. Uh, and the idea is you just black and white take turns to place down the stone at some intersection. Um, and there's basically two rules. The first rule is that if you completely surround a stone, then it gets captured and removed from, a, from the board. Or if you surround any contiguous block of stones, similarly, they get captured and removed from the board. And at the end of the game, the player with more territory wins the game. So this is an end game position, and we see that black has surrounded this number of intersections, but white has surrounded more intersections over here, so in this position white would have won the game. And so the goal of the game is to kind of place down your stones in the way that, that maximizes the amount of territory you get. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so it's a fun game. Um, yeah. Okay, so roughly what we're going to do, and we'll talk about this more in the games lecture, is we're going to consider a particular reward function for, to turn this into a reinforcement learning problem, to turn it into an MVP. And, and in a game, you know, what we really care about is winning the game. So let's define that in our reward function. Let's say you know, we have a reward which is zero for every step that's intermediate where we're still playing. It's like the chess example we were talking about earlier. And then at the end of this, we'll talk about a reward that's one if, if black wins, and then zero if white wins in the final terminal position. And then what we're going to do is we're going to consider policies for both sides. We're going to do this by self-play. We consider we're going to pick actions for both sides. And we're basically going to now try and learn a value function, which essentially tells us you know, how good is some position S. Like if I show you this board configuration, is it good? You know, is black going to win or is white going to win? We want to know if this thing's good. And we define it in the usual way, but because it's a two-player game, there's just a little twist. So, so now when we do our rollouts, when we do our our Monte Carlo evaluation, we're trying to learn the expected value, like will I win um, on average from this position? So 
the probability that black wins from this position. Um, but what we really care about is the optimal value function, and this is why we need a search tree. Um, and the search tree is trying to find something like the minimax value. Like if, if black is trying to, like, it's the best way to, uh, to play if your opponent's trying their best to beat you and so forth, all the way down the tree. Um, we'll get more into that in the final lecture. So Monte Carlo evaluation looks something like this, where you might start in this, this is the simple Monte Carlo evaluation, no search tree yet. Um, you start in this position here, um, and I want to know, well, you know, am I going to win or not? And so what we can do is we can just roll out some games using our simulation policy. We're going to try four different versions where I'm going to imagine what happens next four different times without really playing my opponent. Um, in each of those, I might see I uh, won two of them and lost two of them. And so now I can say, well, I've got an estimated value for this position, which is 2 out of 4 or 0.5. So it's a very simple way to estimate how good a position is. And it turns out that you know, actually using you know, complicated value function approximation, it's very hard to get um, a value function approximate using you know, sophisticated machine learning methods. Um, it's hard to even do as well as this naive approach, because this thing is kind of dynamically probing how good the position is from now onwards. And sort of really focusing on this start situation. We're ignoring all the many other games that we might be in that, that are just irrelevant to us right now. It's forward search. OK. And now to turn this into a tree search algorithm, um, what we have is we can apply this Monte Carlo tree search idea now. And I'm just going to walk through a few iterations of this algorithm to make it concrete. Um, and so what we have here, this notation basically tells us that we've got some state that we visited for the first time. So this something we're adding into our search tree, so we'll mark that with a star. Um, we add in this state, we're going to say, okay, I'm going to start in this root state. Um, I'm going to run some rollout. So these diamond states are things that we don't store in our search tree, but we just pass through um, until we end up in this square state, which basically means a terminal state where we finish the game. And the one means that, that we won that game, or the black won that game. Okay, so black won that game, that was the reward that we saw at the end. And so now we can start to fill in the values in our search tree. So we started here. We ran a simulation to the end, black won, so we can start to source some statistics in this node here. We can say um, black won one game out of one from that node onwards. <laughs> um, so let's run one iteration further. So now we start back at our root state here. This is the position I'm really in that I'm trying to figure out. This is now, and I'm trying to figure out what to do from now onwards. And I'm building up my search tree of all the things I've visited so far. And so now I'm going to add in a new position into my search tree. I'm going to run a new simulation from here onwards. Um, this time, white ended up winning, so that's a value of zero. So now I can say, well, this new node, we got zero out of one from there. And this root node uh, has now had one out of two. So we can start to get more sophisticated information at the root here. And now I can use this to start to guide our search. So we can say, OK, well, you know, this wasn't so successful for white. To, uh, uh, this wasn't so successful for black to get zero out of one over here, so maybe black should choose a different move. Um, so we use the tree policy to guide us. And so now black can choose this, this new move over here, add that into our search tree, run a simulation, see that black wins this time, fill in this with one win out of one. Now we've got two out of three wins at the root. Continue. And as we start to continue this, we see we get richer and richer contingencies in our search tree we're starting to expand this tree of look-ahead possibilities towards the things which have been most promising. So now we see, you know, let's go this way again. It, was, it worked for us before. This is looking better than this. So let's try going this way again. Um, this time we add in a new situation over here, a new state we haven't seen before. Run a simulation. Uh, white wins. Back that up. We've got zero out of one here. One win out of two here, and now two out of four at the root. But this still looks better than this. So now we can run another simulation. And we start to expand <coughs> the parts of the search tree which are looking most promising. So we run again, get a win for black, back this up all the way up this path here. And what happens is as you run this algorithm out, you see that it very deeply develops the parts of the search tree which are most promising, which are leading to the best results for both players. And it completely ignores the parts of the search tree which are useless because they're getting bad results. And what you need to do is just, just make sure that you continue to explore these bad parts of the tree a little bit to make sure that you don't um, ignore them completely. Yeah, question? But you've run the, the, the policy just for one trajectory there, right? And there are many possible 
alternative trajectories from that point, which you may... From this point onwards. Yeah. yeah. So we're making an assumption, we're making a simplification, which is that, that, these, that our, simulation proxy is act, our simulation policy is acting as a reasonable proxy yes. for doing a deeper it's search. Like a canonical sort of trace for that point in the tree. But I mean, how but, realistic is that? I mean, there are many okay. so, alternatives. So there are many alternatives, and it might be that you miss some information here. But the good news is that over time, we're just going to develop the tree further and further and further. And so this thing is just acting as a, as a heuristic to guide us towards the best parts of the space. And eventually, it gets placed, it gets replaced by, by the real information in the tree. And, and so asymptotically, the, any, any bias that we introduce in this simulation policy gets removed as we go further and further, further in. And in practice, um, it does matter a lot which policy you choose here. But nevertheless, even with very naive policies, even if you just pick things un uniform randomly, this, this strategy works very, very well. So uniform random isn't as dumb as you might think in many situations. <clears throat> OK, so why is this a good idea? Well, it's highly selective. It's a kind of best first search, where every um, episode we kind of go back to the root and get to pick again which path we want to follow through this search tree. So every iteration we get to pick, actually this way is better than this way. So it's a kind of best first search. Uh, and it evaluates states dynamically. It's not like dynamic programming, which is focusing on the entire state space. Here we're dynamically evaluating the position we're in right now. We know that we're in this position, so let's invest more resource into that position dynamically rather than offline learning some function approximator that has to cover the entire state space. It uses sampling, sample-based planning method, which breaks the curse of dimensionality. We don't have to consider all possible things that we might do or all possible things the environment might do. We just sample them and look at what's working well. And it works for black box models, so we, we only need to use our model to sample from. So this thing works well, it scales well, any time you can parallelize it, it's got lots of good properties. So just to go back to the Go example, how has this worked? So this is a plot of how strong Go programs um, have become over time. Um, and what we see is that these asterisk programs down here were the state of the art before this Monte Carlo search algorithms came around. Um, and then what happened is the first Monte Carlo search program, Mogo, um, and Crazy Stone, these guys came along and made these big leaps forward in performance that uh, very quickly kind of overtook. And there's been this steady progress. All of these programs are Monte Carlo programs. And actually, if you continue it out to, to today, they're now playing at around six Dan which is roughly as strong as the strongest players in the UK for a problem that was considered to be something that humans would um, always dominate computers over. So until this algorithm came along, there was no alternative really. Um, so it's very effective, um, particularly in large complicated domains where you can't, where brute force search isn't effective and you need to be selective and you need to dynamically evaluate positions because you have no real idea of who's winning or losing otherwise. Also works very well in, in MDP, single agent domains. It's a widely used tool across reinforcement learning now. Can you explain the y-axis? Ah, sorry, yeah. Yes, I should explain this diagram. So this is time. The y-axis is the strength of the Go program over time. This is the, um, the rankings that humans use. Um, so starting from Q levels, which are like, so, um, so lower Q is better, and then higher down is better. So it's like kind of, you know, one down, it's like, get to black belt or something and go, and then it just um, gets stronger and stronger up to about nine down. Um, so uh, that's what this axis, and it means, so the difference between one, um, so, so this distance difference here basically means that if this player gave one free move to this player, they'd be at an equal strength. So that's how you calibrate this, this scale at every level. Okay, so Having advertised this Monte Carlo tree search approach, Monte Carlo search is a very effective method for planning, I now want to just bring us back and say that's just one example of a family of very effective search algorithms. And I really don't want to give the impression that you have to commit to this particular way of doing Monte Carlo with this particular tree structure and this particular simulation policies and so forth. It's the, the, the key ideas are doing forward search um, and sampling. If you use those two ideas, you can get very far that brings you to really good parts of the state space, and applying model-free reinforcement learning methods to those simulations. So what if we consider other model-free reinforcement learning approaches? So what if we do our simulation-based search idea, so we start from now, we imagine trajectories of experience, but instead of applying Monte Carlo learning, let's apply 
TD learning, let's apply Sasa, let's apply you know, our familiar bootstrapping based methods that were so effective earlier in the course and which we saw were generally tended to outperform Monte Carlo learning. And so the main idea is to, um, where Monte Carlo tree search applies Monte Carlo control for the sub MDP from now, we're going to develop something called TD search, which applies Sasa to the sub MTP from now. Just to build that spectrum of ideas and show you that there are many possibilities. And so why should we do this? Well, because we've seen that bootstrapping is helpful. We've seen in when we're doing model free RL, when we're not planning, but in our usual setting of just reinforcement learning, we saw that TD learning reduced variance. Um, it could be more efficient than Monte Carlo. And when we found this lambda parameter that we were often much more efficient by trading off between Monte Carlo and, and bootstrapping. And the same is true when we use these planning methods for simulation-based search. So TD search can reduce the variance and increase the bias. Um, it's usually more efficient. Um, actually, um, there are some exceptions to that, but on the whole, it can work very well. And if you choose the lambda parameter well, you can do much better than Monte Carlo backups. So what does it look like? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start again from our real state, our start state. This is now. This ST is now, our moment now. But now we're going to estimate a value function, an action value function. Um, and we can do it in the same way. We can store this in, in the nodes of our search tree. Um, but for each step of simulation, what we're going to do is, instead of waiting to the end of the episode and taking the return of that whole episode and estimating values by the mean return, we estimate it by temporal difference learning, by bootstrapping, by saying, you know, the value of being in this node here is the reward which I got for one step plus the value of the node I ended up in after that. We bootstrap. Um, and this is particularly effective in, um, in domains where you can reach states in lots of different ways, where you're not just building a strict tree, but you can actually get back to states in lots of different paths, in which case bootstrapping is very effective because you might have seen your child from another path and you might already know something about the value, and now you reach that same state again from some other path, you already know that it's a good state, not a bad state. So you don't have to just run out new trajectory. So we update our, our action values by Sasa, for example, um, and we select actions by acting greedily with respect to our key values, just as before. So the only thing we've changed in our, from Monte Carlo search is the way in which we update our action values. We use temporal difference learning instead of Monte Carlo learning. And that can really help things. And the only thing I want to point out, but I'm not going to have time to go into, is that you can also use function approximation here. There's no reason that you have to represent your Q values for either Monte Carlo search or TD search. There's no reason you have to represent your action value function using a search tree or using a table lookup. You can use a function approximator, and that can help a lot. Um, so I can talk to you about that afterwards. We have some nice examples, like for the game of Civilization, a computer game, where that really helps a lot have to do that if you want to um, be effective there. State space is too big otherwise in the action space. Okay, so last um, last slide, and then just one result slide. So, so let's come back to the diner idea. So what was the diner idea? The diner idea said, well, we don't just have to learn from real experience, we don't just have to learn from simulated experience, we can combine these things together. So let's do the same thing, but with our forward search algorithm now. Um, so this is the idea of Dyna2. And the idea of Dyna2 is it basically maintains two value functions. You can think of these as like a long-term memory and a short-term memory, or a working memory. So it basically um, updates its long-term memory from real experience. So it's basically got one set of, uh, one value function, one uh, saying how good things are when you really experience them, which is kind of the general domain knowledge. Um, and you also have some short-term memory. This is like your search tree now. Your search tree is the thing that tells you how good is it in my search tree. For starting from now, uh, I'm going to learn from simulations and update my search tree and say, you know, in this search tree, I've tried a few things. I've done my TD backups, and I figured out that in this particular situation I'm in, you know, it's a really bad idea to go um, um, and put my hand up here because I know that in this particular situation I'll fall off the rock. This thing tells me that, you know, in general, it's a good idea to move your hands like this. This thing tells me that I've done some look ahead from this point onwards, and I know that in this situation, this rock is loose, and I'll probably fall over if I move my hand here. So the idea is we maintain two different types of memory. We update one of them from real experience, and one of them from simulated experience. And then we combine them together, 
to sum these two together to give us our overall value function. I'm sorry I don't have time to give more details. I'll just put up one plot, which is just the final slide on this kind of Go example, um, just to show what happens when you combine these ideas together. Um, so this um, y-axis now is the winning rate against a standard benchmark program called Nugo. Um, this x-axis is how much thinking time we do, like the number of simulations that we run before making an actual, um, picking an actual move. This dashed black line is a Monte Carlo tree search, the effective method we looked at before. And now what we see is what happens if we use temporal difference learning instead of Monte Carlo learning. So if we were just to apply temporal difference learning to real experience, this is learning about the whole state space of Go and not specializing on, on the situation I'm in right now. So if I was to learn about the whole state space for Go, I get this very poor winning rate of around 5%. If I apply exactly the same updates, exactly the same SASA updates, exactly the same representation of Q, everything exactly the same, but I apply it to simulated experience, doing this forward search idea, um, it immediately um, it does much, much better. We get, um, so we need to do a minimal amount of computation, maybe like a thousand steps of computation, and then we start doing really, really well and outperforming Monte Carlo's research, because bootstrapping is effective. And finally, the Diner 2 idea is this blue line here, which combines the best of both worlds. So this is something which learns about real experience by running real trajectories, and so this means that we're actually able to learn from real experience, and even before we do any thinking, we already know what to do, because we've seen We've got this general knowledge about how to behave in general. And we also have the specific knowledge about the current situation we're in. We learn about the wobbly um, rock and exactly how to adapt to the current situation. Okay, that's it. I know there's a lot of ideas there. Um, I really just want to emphasize the main ideas that planning and simulation-based search, an effective method for planning is to apply, use our model just to sample trajectories to imagine what might happen next and apply your favorite reinforcement learning method, whether it's Monte Carlo control, SASA, combining uh, real experience with simulated experience in this diner way. The main idea is that, that learning from simulation is an effective method for search. That was the, that's the final section of the, today's class. And this really works well in practice. Okay, next week we're gonna talk about exploration and exploitation. And the final class we'll talk about um, uh, we'll talk about the games case study. Thank you very much. Oh, one final thing, which is um, if people are interested, um, I should advertise that DeepMind are uh, recruiting. Um, <laughs> so if that's something you are, might be interested in, then um, I will say, let me just flash up the right slide. So if you're interested in that, then you can wait one second and I'll flash up the correct slide with the uh, right email address and then you can, you can contact that email address. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>